Good evening. I hope that since we last spoke, last Parsha, that your week was productive and successful. This week's Parsha, Parsha's Kiseitse, the Baal Shem Tov said on the comment that was made to him that it usually comes out always at the beginning of Elul, and he said rightfully so, because the first thing is the battle with the Eight Sahara. We go in Kiseitse La Milchama, and he did many Ramazim that dealt with the Milchama of the year of being on track, doing mitzvahs properly, and he made the comment that the whole year and the whole life, for that matter, is one slap back and forth the Sahara to the person. The person slips, that was the slap from the Sahara. The person feels guilty and does tshuva, that's his slap back. And the Baal Shem Tov concluded his remark with the statement that the main thing in life is to make sure that before the person, after 120 years, passes on, that he got in the last slap, meaning that he remained uh, in this world up to the point to do proper tshuva, and that he was able to then move on and have a clean slate. Now, the Pasuk says, Ki la milchama alu yevecha, that when you go out and wage war with your enemy, unesano Hashem elokecha biodecha, and he gives into your hand <coughs> the foe, that you were fighting, vishavisa shivyo, and you take into cap captivity your captive. And it's the parsha of Yafas Torah, we know. Now, the question is posed by three different Mephorshim. Why is the word shivyo employed? Shivyo means normally <clears throat> when we refer to his captive, Shivyo, when really it should say Shivicha, your captive, your captive, that you caught the person and he's now in your possession. So <clears throat> all of them say the same thing that your captive, meaning your personal captive, who is the shivyo, the, sh the one that is out there for every year, that's the war that we're talking about. Not al shot, but we're talking al Drush, that there is a constant waging of war every day from the time the person gets up the person was out and took a drink at night and ended up sleeping to 10 o'clock and he threw out the window, the mitzvah of Kriyashma Bismana, of the Araisa. Why? Well, I was tired. Well, and that's how he goes. He glides through life. So the Icar is Vishavisa Shivyo that we should set our mind, and that's Elul, that's the essence of Elul, to not only try to do better, but even if it's one point in our lives that we want to polish and bring out the luster of what we're doing in the mitzvah to do it better, to do it with better intent, to do it with a frame of mind that there's happiness which is exuded from the act itself, that we should be able to say that there's something that we have to show from all of the speeches and all of the talk that's bottom line. Now, if you remember in the Haftorah, <coughs> Uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, it ended off 
ציון במשפט תיפודר ושווה בצדוקו. צדוקו sometimes can be the mightiest weaponry that a person can effectively, like we said, then that there is the power of tzedakah, that a, it can bring redemption, that it can save lives. Tatsil mimovis. So when we're talking about doing tshuva in El, and we say vishavisa, or vishaveha bitstaka, that that's a remise to this Pusik about captivity, and how do we capture the enemy? And the vishaveha bitstaka, which doesn't go on this Pusik, but it's a remise to what this is, can be a, obtained and achieved strongly through tzedakah. And that's why in addition to the tilim, addition to the shoifer every day, that in addition to the ledavar Hashem ori v'yishi, that there is a constant reminder that these things are limited. We hear Schäufer as the minic for all of Elo. <clears throat> for the 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and that's it. We say L'dovet Hashem Ori V'yishi, and our Bakosha concludes. But Tzedakah, when a person gives it and says, Rabbana Shaloylam, it should be a Shana Tova Masuka, for Gantz Klal Yisrael, Jews are suffering worldwide, and there's so much that has to be done to achieve the supplication and the results of it, that we have a good year, and not just wish and talk, and then go back and do whatever we want, but to be able to miyala Hashem umiyakum bimkom kocho, to go up, a mountain of holiness is not so hard. We all want it, we all fight to achieve it, but umi yakum bimkom kacha, who can stay there? Who can remain there that we don't automatically slip back? And that the tremendous promises and undertakings of a new year is out the window with a whiff that in one second we can slide back down the entire ladder. Now there is, on that topic, as I said to you two weeks ago from the Balatanya, that there is such a thing as a new ore and a new mazel every year. And in the words Aser to Aser, which was laid by Hamishi, in Parsha's Re'eh. Aser to Aser means Aser, you should give a tenth. <clears throat> to Aser, you should certainly underscore and stress the importance of that tenth. The Gemara learns Aser, give a ten percent. Bishvil Shetis Asher, in order that you should become rich. Now the Dorshe Rishumo say, Aser, a tenth of Te'aser. The word Te'aser is spelled Tof Ayin Sin Reish. And Aser, if you take a tenth of each of those letters, Aser is Ayin, is 70. But what's 10% of, no, not of Aser, of Te'aser? That of the Tof is 400. Now, if you take 10% to 400, it's 40. Aser te aser, ayin, is 70. 10% of 70 is 7. That's 47. 40 from the tof and 7 from the ayin. The sin is 300. So if you take 10% of 300, that's 30. 
So we have a total of 77, 40 plus 7 plus 30. And the last race is 210% is 20 is a chaf. And the Dorsha Rishuma said, Aser, that if you give your tenth to tzedakah religiously, then ta'aser, you're going to be soicha to the tenth of the word ta'aser, which is 40, 7, 30, and 20, which is the gematria, the numerical value of mazel. The word mazloch. Mazloch is exactly the gematria of 10% of this aser. That you give aser, then that 10% aser is 10% of this aser, that it spells masloch. And we know that there is a lengthy discussion in the last Ahmed of the Gemara Shabbos, whether there is such a thing as mazel by Claude Yisrael. And there's different op one opinions. Yes, one opinion is no, but Rashi says there that even according to the one that ain mazel Yisrael, that mazel, there's no mazel by Claude Yisrael, agrees that there is mazel. But what is the difference of opinion between these two differences? Whether or not can a person change his mazel in his lifetime? And <clears throat> We know that there is mazel, of course, that, that Avram Avinu, when he was told he's going to have a baby, he, he said, how could you say I'm going to have a child? I was born under the constellation, the mazel, that it's impossible for me to have a baby. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu took him outside, and he took him out of that mazel and put him from the east into the west. So he was able, so we see there's such a thing as mazel. But the Gemara says, what is the difference of opinion when we say that one holds you could change mazel, you can't change mazel, that according even to the opinion that you cannot change your mazel, whatever you're born with, that's what you die with that he agrees that there's one way for a person to change their muscle. And that's, the Gemara says in Moed Katten, schus gadol. The Toysus there says that someone, even according to the opinion that you could never change your, he admits that you could change your muscle if you have a schus gadol. And the Mephorshim say, what is this schus gadol? It is talking about tzedakah to almanos and to yisoyim. That not just tzedakah, because there's higher levels, that helping an almana and helping a yasom is the biggest format of tzedakah. And you take a $10 bill, a $100 bill, a $1,000, and you give it to the almana, you give it to the yasom, you are bringing on yourself down the biggest level of mazel and bracha that a person could be zoiche to. Now, it says in our parsha the mitzvah of shiluach hakan, which means that if you come across a nest and there are, there are birds, little birds in it, and the mother, so there is a tzivoy, that you cannot take the children without first sending away the mother. Um, and the Ramban says that this is not just compassion for the mother, that if you take away her children right in front of her face, that that's lacking in compassion, but it's to make us more compassionate. That a yid becomes a better Jew throughout his life and throughout his acts. Whatever he does, when there's a background of compassion, of love, of feeling, of pity, then that enriches the attitude of the person 
in how he treats with people and, and issues and communities and things that he has to deal with. So the Ramban says that it uplifts us while we are compassionate to the mother bird. Now the Medrash says that there are two mitzvahs that it says that you are going to live longer. And there's different opinions. One opinion the Gemara is that when it says live longer, it means Olam haba, you're going to get more olam haba. Others say no, it means just what it says. You're going to live in this world longer. But the Medrash says an interesting comment that on the two things that it says longevity, that you will live longer, that one is the hardest mitzvah in the world and the other is the easiest mitzvah that Shiluach HaKan, the Medrash says, is Kal Sheba Kalm, the easiest mitzvah to do. And the hardest mitzvah do, to do is Varach the Yomim, the Kibra Ve'em. Now the truth is this, that, you know, building a sukkah is hard, uh, fasting on Yom Kippur is hard, there are things that are that are difficult. We love the average person loves his parents. And why in kibbut Ava Aim is that called and classified as the hardest mitzvah? And what I want to share to you is what the Medrash is bringing out and what the Mephorshaya Medrash say. Because that is to us a very very important lesson. And that is that when a child is born, for his first 20 years, he has to come on to the parent. When he's four years old, he has to have, have his shoes, help with tying his shoes. He has to be bathed. He has to have fresh clothes. He has to have a, a breakfast and a dinner and a lunch for him to get through the day. So his existence is very much dependent on the help of the parents and loving parents in normal homes. They're happy to do it. It's their child. And yes, they have to be in the beck and call. They hear a child coughing very badly in the middle of the night. They jump out of bed to run to the child to see if the child is okay. But the Mephorshim say that when a child gets to an age that he does not need the parents anymore, there's a little bit of an uphill battle to void a inner psychological resistance to the parent because it wants to claim and reclaim its independence. That means when somebody is, let's say, not related, and they're living in someone's house, and the person treats him like a child, that child, when he wins the lottery, now, there's different levels, obviously, in this, but when he wins the lottery, the first person that he should come running he just won the $25 million is to the person that, who took care of him since he's a child and give him a million dollars. But many times it won't happen. They'll buy him a nice gift and they'll try to dis. Oh, now I have the money. I don't need you. Because it's an acknowledgement of how much they had to come on to the parent or the other person. And even though that we go through life loving a parent and worrying about a parent, and I'm not saying from love to hate, but what the Mephorshim say is that there is a crying need from within to become independent and not under the wing of the person 
who controlled their life and who helped them get to where they are in life. And as strange as it sounds, because we love our parents dearly, but if the Mepharshim say it, there must, there's truth to it. And that independence, the Medrash says, makes it the hardest mitzvah. Because to do the mitzvah properly doesn't just mean coming on Mother's Day with a card to the nursing home. That means keeping the parent home with the difficulties of keeping an elderly parent at home. And not just getting away with saying, well, I can't care for her, I'm too busy, and I'm in business, and then she has to be attended to, I can't afford an attendant, I can't. And a child at six would never think of doing such a thing because they're still under the wing of the parent that's part and parcel of the child. So we have to dust off some of that inherent bad behavior that shows its ugly face at times when we have to fight to do proper keep it off a I don't mean tokenism. And which child wouldn't bring the hot dinner to the table and help set up and spend the 15 minutes? But I'm talking an inner feeling which manifests itself in a cry for independence after the 20 years of being brought up. Now, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky once said on this Parsha, Parsha's Kiseitse, that it's interesting that there are so many mitzvahs in this center. Uh, we have the mitzvah, uh, we talk about Bechor, Bahoya Biyom, Anchilo, Esbona, Vesa, Sharia, Lo, and about the Bechor. And we have the mitzvah also dealing with a ben surer morer. But we also have the halachas of Kiddushin, Yevama, Chalitza, uh, Gerishin, someone gives a get. We learn it from the Psukim in this parsha. So there's a load of mitzvahs in this parsha. And Rav Yaakov Zechrona Levrocha asked, why isn't so many of these mitzvahs, let's say Kedushin and Gerashin and Yavama, all in Vayikra when it deals with prohibited relationships and Ish and Isha and all of these things. And the Rosh Hashiva answered a very beautiful answer, an eye-opener. And that is that the entire Sefer Devorim deals with Klal Yisrael. It doesn't deal with individual. It was 36 days that the Sefer Devorim was said from Rosh Chodesh Shvatel Vav Ador, and then Moshe Rabbeinu was nifter on the 37th door. And this was like his goodbye speech, so to speak. And according to Rashi, that the, the Melech Yisrael had two Sifrei Torah. That means every year is supposed to have a Sifrei Torah, but the Melech, the king, had a Sefer Torah like everyone else. And then he had a Sefer Torah that he kept with him. It was right next to him. And he read in it every single year. Now, according to Rashi, that Sefer Torah was only Devorah. It was not Horatius Shemos. <coughs> Excuse me. According to Rashi, others disagree with him. Excuse me. But... Rav Yaakov said that the reason that Rashi holds it was only because it was a different stature. That all the other four were said to the individual and mitzvahs and tefillin that you have to put on tefillin, you have to do this, you have to... <coughs> excuse me. 
Excuse me. Over here in Devarim, we are dealing with Klal Yisrael. So the Rosh Shiva asks, if I'm saying that it's Klal Yisrael, Kedushin is an individual. Or he gets a man and woman get married and have a family. That's their individual house. So the Rosh Shiva answered and said, that when you have a thousand families living in a thousand houses, it's not a thousand separate houses. It's one Klal Yisrael. It's all with unity. And he brought a beautiful raya because he said that when a chosen gets married, in the first seven days of the, from the chasna, if he goes into shul, or not if, when he goes into shul to daven, the tzibur does not say tachma. Now, if someone's a novel, lo aleinu, lo aleicha, and he goes into shul, and he just lost his father, he lost his mother, and a novel does not say Tachnun, but he doesn't potter up the rest of the tzibur. They all have to say Tachnun, and only he doesn't. But by the Chosun, he doesn't say, and the whole tzibur does not say. What's the difference? Because the Avelis is his Avelis. It really has nothing, I mean, we feel sorry for the person, but it's not the other person's Avelis. But when a person gets married, it is continuance of the chain of Klal Yisrael. It's a Klal Yisrael Simcha, and that's why no one else says, this, says any Tachna at the time when a Chosen comes into Davin. Because it's all of our Simchas. And a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Because if it's a strong chain, but in one of the links, it's very weak. So when you start to pull, the chain will be lost. So that message really is a message to every single yid in his house and his household that you have to think of your household as being part of the Klal. We're not an individual. Klal Yisrael, you can't say Kaddish and Kedusha without a minion. You need other Jews. We're part of that link. We're part of the totality. And that totality is remember when we take our children to a Bubba and say that every Sunday and spend an hour there and let them see and remember how the Zaydi act, how the Zaydi said a bracha, how the Zaydi benched, how the Zaydi did mitzvahs. But if we come twice a year just to wish a good Yom Tif era of Pesach and a good year for, for Rosh Hashanah, what is that grandchild learning from a Zayda who is part of the link and chain two generations before to Har Sinai? And Rav Yaakov used to speak a lot about this because he felt the achrayas of a father and mother is not only ironing the shirt and cooking the meat for dinner, there has to be a broader scope and appreciation of what we're doing and how we live to make sure that it's given down, that we're moving on to the next generation because that's part of our achrayas, not just to bring home money to pay for the, the grocery bill, but it's to give over to the next generation. And the only way that you give over is how you live and that is the reason, as a matter of fact, Mephorshim asked, it says in the very, like, sixth or seventh Pusik when it talks about Nachala in this week's Seder Kisei, it says, Vahoya,
it opens with the word Vahoya. Now that's talking about when the father dies. What's the simcha? We know that Vahoya is simcha. Vayahi is sad. So what's the simcha? And he gives over the Pasuk, says, Esa sher ye elo. That means whatever the father possessed, he gives over to the child. Well, what else could he give over? He only could give over what he possesses. The money, uh, the, 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 the furniture, the pictures of all the uh, family events. Only what he has. So why does the Pasuk ask? And this is from the Mephorshim. Asa share ye alone and the Mephorshim say, because it's a Vahoya, it's a Lashon of Simcha, that when he gives over Asa share ye alone, not just the money and the thing, but he gives over the richness of what Yiddishkeit and what a mitzvah and what a voida is to his children, that's the Vahoya. Then it is a Simcha. Because unfortunately, when it comes to the Gashmias, there are some people who are ready to throw away a 40, a 60, an 80 year relationship with a brother, with a sister, whatever, over money. And we know money comes and goes. You can get a hold of money and six months later it's gone. So what do you have? But yet a family relationship destroy a family because of inheritance? And people should strive to make sure that it never comes to that. What the person's supposed to have, if he has the amuna, he'll get it anyway. He doesn't have to fight for the extra twenty or forty or hundred thousand with the with the rest of the family if they feel differently. If he's gonna have to get it, he's gonna get it. Hashem will make sure he gets it. But we don't have to go out of our way to alienate over things, but we should look to unite and give over the richness of what your family is all about to your children and to your grandchildren. Now, we know that the mitzvah of shotness is in this week's parasha also. There's many, many mitzvahs in this parasha. And there's not just shotness as people think of clothes that we shouldn't put wool and linen into one, <laughs> excuse me, into one garment. And the Arizal goes so far to say that if somebody puts on a coat or a suit with sharpness, his tefillahs are locked out of heaven for 40 days. That it is so loathsome. And I once, in one of the shiurim, explained because by Cain and Hevel, the world disaster of death came to the world. One killed the other, and it was shotness. One had flax, cotton, and one had wool. Uh, Semeru pishtim. And that's the mitzvah of this week's sedra, but it's not only that, it's mixing seeds. And it also talks about shor vachamor, that lo sachmos shor vachamor yachto, that when you plow a field, you cannot put together a ox, a shor, and a donkey, a chamor, together. Now the Evan Ezra used to say, he said in his Pirush, that the reason that you cannot have a shore and a chamor together, and it just it's a reason of understanding because shotness is, is really a chok. It's one of the chok, like paraduma, like basar b'cholov, that it's a chok, so we don't have the reasoning. But when they try to give a flavor of what's going on, so the Ebenezer says, because if the shore who in its innate ability moves much faster than a chamor, than a donkey, and if you put them brittle together, 
that they both have to move at the same pace. They're tied together. So then you're going to be mitzar v'chamor. It's going to have to do a pace that it, it's beyond their capacity. So out of Rachmanis, and to teach us compassion, we were told don't put the two together because it's going to be a hardship for one of the two. The Das Zekenim Bali Toysvis says a different reason. That the shore eats constantly. That means whenever it's grazing by grass, it keeps chewing and eating and eating. And the chamor doesn't. So it's going to be with someone that's chewing and swallowing and eating. And we know how as human beings, if we're sitting lunchtime and we're waiting for someone to come and meet on the person sitting there and enjoying the salad and enjoying the the fish and the eating and the and where the person sitting there and they're hungry, they're ready for lunch also, that it's in a way like teasing, it's a way like I don't want to use the word torturing, but it's making the other one uncomfortable, not in a comfortable state. So the Dazakanim says that that's the reason we cannot put the shore and the chamor together because it will bring that bad feeling to the chamor at the pace, not of movement, but they say because of the eating, the constant chewing and eating, which the shore does much, much more than the chamor. And the point for us to remember is we have to be considerate that when we're walking with someone that maybe we're in better shape and the other person needs a little more time and you want to move a little quicker because it's healthier you want to be a little more vigorous you want to what about the other person that wants that's walking with you and that's talking to you are you forcing them to be panting and out of breath because you want a certain pace? Or in eating at a table, if someone needs five more minutes than you do have, or that you need to eat and to finish, how about giving them a chance in a courteous way and not making comments to make them uncomfortable? That they're eating and they're already upset, they're eating and they're already not so comfortable. And that goes through life. It could be somebody who's davening in shul. They need a little extra time. And no, where's everyone running to? If one of the people in the shul walked up to somebody else and said, oh, did you hear what happened with Chaim Yankel? And the person, oh, no, what happened? Suddenly he has 10 minutes to hear all the gossip and all the everything that took place. But he didn't have two minutes for Rov Sieber to finish Shemana Esrei so that they could say Kedusha and answer Amen and say Yehoshmi Rabbah after Shemana Esrei because they had to move on. That Chas Hashem Davening should take five more minutes than he wants it to be. So when we talk about consideration of a shore and a Chamor and we think about the concept, we can come to a very profound understanding that our movement and our pace in life has to be with the recognition and sensitivity for the family, the person we're with, and the whole community. Now, I want to say to you that in our Seder also, it talks about Amon and Moab. And it says that we are never, ever, ever allowed to marry into them and to allow them to marry into us. And then two Pesukim later, it says that the Mitzvah, an Egyptian, after three generations, if they're Magyar, they can come in to be a Jew and you can marry them. Now, if I would ask you, and the Pusik gives a reason, because when you ask them for bread and water and you were willing to pay top price, 
and they had a natural resource of water. We weren't taking their limited water. They had access to plenty of water. And we asked if they would sell it. We're not asking to give us anything free. They said no. And that's what the Pasuk says. Look in the parsha. Because of that. Now, if I were to independently ask you, who do you think was worse, the Mitzrayim or the Amon and Moyov? Many people would say the Mitzrayim. They say, okay, they didn't want to sell us the water and the, and the bread. You know, mean-spirited people. They had plenty of it, they didn't want it. But the Mitzrayim, they threw our kids into the water. They took every building that we built and after sweating and bleeding and, and forcing oneself to completion, they, in front of our eyes, demolished the building to completely demoralize us. I mean, what was going on in Mitzrayim was terrible. So who was really worse, Moab and Ammon, who didn't give us the bread and water, or Mitzrayim? Yet it says that we could never, ever marry into Ammon and Moab. And to Mitzrayim, we have to wait three generations. Doesn't make sense, but the Mephorshim explain. We want the DNA of Kla Yisrael to be good, solid, and to be undiluted in its goodness. And true that the Mitzrayim did what they did, and many said that these people who did these things, throwing the kids in the water, were under duress, that they were ordered to do it or else. But they did bad things, but it wasn't their essence. The essence, the core of Am Amon and Moyov are, is rotten, is mean-spirited. The DNA is bad. And to mix with DNA that is absolutely polluted with everything bad that we want no part of. Mitzrayim, they were forced, they were not forced. It wasn't in their DNA though. And that's why the Torah says that the Mitzrayim we could, after a while, marry, but not Ammon and Moyov. Now, there is a parsha here called Soirer Omorah. It means a young boy, and he's zoilel v'sove. He is consuming at a rate of unbelievable thirst, drinking wine and, and eating food. And the Torah says that the parents bring him to bed so that he can be put to death. Now the Gemara says, that one opinion is it never happened. And the, another opinion is he remembers one case and he even was in the city when it happened. But the reason that the, the Mandiomer says that it never happened is because, for instance, one example, there are so many requirements that a Sore or Mura, this rebellious child, has to be the Pasuk says, Einenu, they say before the Vesna, Einenu Shomea Bikolein. He doesn't listen to our voice. And that's singular, our voice, not voices, voice. And the Gemara Darshan's from that, that the husband and wife have to have the exact same voice. So therefore, if it does, they don't have the exact same voice, they cannot have a parsha of Sarah or Bar. And there's so many details like that that it's almost an impossibility. What do you mean? The husband and the wife have the exact same voice? So it probably could never happen. But the Darshanim learned from it something. 
And what do they say about this statement? They say that when a father and mother are bringing up children, they have to have consistency. The child cannot go to the mother and say, you know, I want to go out tonight with my friends. And she said, no, it's too late. You have to get up for minion in the morning. I don't want you to go. And then he goes to the father and the father says, yeah, I don't care if you go. There's no consistency. It has to be sermonically the same voice. Parents have to say and coordinate a unified approach that the child is not mixed up and gets mixed messages. Oh, you gave me a speech, it was so terrible, but, but Tati didn't say that. He said that, you know, he didn't see anything wrong or anything bad. And that produces mixed up children who end up in trouble. So there has to be a unifying voice and there has to be unity and continuity with unison to be able to bring out the best in the qualities of children. That means when a child is in a house growing up and they see parents who love each other and show affection and consideration, can I bring you a tea? Do you want more of this? And if the husband's being served, Nothing wrong for him to turn to the wife, let me bring you this or that. And the children see this, they thrive on affection in a unified house under one roof. And when they see parents fighting, that disengages the child from the link to them to want to be like them. So we have to underscore that a healthy attitude in a home is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to sow the seeds of love, compassion, sensitivity, and kindness that goes on into the children when they see it expressed and promoted and lifelike example of how they give their their tzedakah, do their chesed, davening. A child sees some parents that they're reading a newspaper while they're benching. What kind of a message is that to a child? How important is that benching? Or davening? Or talking during Chazor Sashatz? or missing words of Kriya Satar. What is the example? What's the role model? So that unity, that's what we learned from Sarah, if it's not the same voice of practice and of love and appreciation in the household, we are in trouble with those children. And we have to bring out the best in them by being that role model and example. And I wish to each and every one of you that you should all have, all of us, should have tremendous nachas from our children. We work our whole lives to pay tuition, to provide food, to provide delicious onik Shabbos and delicious sumptuous meals for Shabbos and Yom Tif. We're dedicating our lives to bringing up our families properly. And we should always be able to see as the fruits of labor come to fruition and that we have real nachas from our families, our friends, and as many tzaddikim used to say, nachas from ourselves. That doesn't mean that a person has to give himself the pat on the back, but he has to realize he's growing and he's in the right track. And then he has nachas for his mitzvahs and mice and tovim. Have a wonderful week.